This podcast contains explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. The following program presents an examination of a criminal investigation. Any individual who may have been investigated or faces criminal charges continues to be considered innocent until proven guilty. 911, what's your emergency? My granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. Her head is bleeding severely. We need an ambulance. This is Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, the podcast. I'm Marsha Clark. Before I get into the case, I just want to thank you for some really terrific, intriguing questions. I'm going to answer them at the end of the show, so stick around. On my A&E show, Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, we examine the Drew Peterson case, Kathleen Savio, and Stacey Peterson. Now, if you've heard of this case, then you probably know that the issue at the core of it is one that is really sadly common. I'm talking about domestic violence, spousal abuse. It's a leading cause of injury and death for women, and it's an issue I'm very familiar with. O.J. Simpson was not the first domestic violence murder that I prosecuted. There were many before him. On this episode, we're going to take a closer look at Drew Peterson's history of domestic violence. But first, here's a quick overview of the case. Drew Peterson was a police officer in Bolingbrook Police Department in Illinois. The story of the case starts with his third wife, Kathleen. She reported him many times for assaulting her and threatening to kill her. But at the time, they were in the throes of a nasty divorce, so no one took her claims seriously. Here's Harry Smith. He was Kathleen Savio's lawyer, and as you'll hear, he handled a few matters for her, but primarily it was the divorce from Drew Peterson. So this was beyond the pale of your experience with other divorce clients. Um, How did that affect you in terms of believing what she was saying It was, at the time, impossible for me to believe that this person existed, meaning Drew. It just didn't seem possible that this was an accurate description. That It's not possible that he was really sitting there thinking he was going to tell her all the time, I'm going to kill you and make it look like an accident. Yeah. You didn't take his threats to be literal. You thought... No. Yes. No. Yeah. No. Kathleen and Drew had been together for almost 10 years. They had two children. By early 2004, the property settlement was close to being finalized, and Kathleen stood to do pretty well, but it never happened. The case continues on and gets set for trial, but Kathleen did not live until the trial date. In March of 2004, she was found dead, face down in a waterless tub. And then, just three and a half years later, Drew's fourth wife, Stacy, went missing. I have no doubt, based on all I've learned during my investigation of this case, that she's not just missing. She's dead. And she, too, was abused by Drew. Today, we're going to take a closer look at the very similar pattern of abuse and controlling behavior Kathleen and Stacy went through. And we'll talk about why their claims weren't taken seriously, what attracted them to Drew to begin with, and why they stayed with Drew for as long as they did. Lastly, we'll talk about what could have been done to save them. Because I have no doubt that if their claims had been taken seriously, both Kathleen and Stacy would still be alive today. Now let's get into the facts of the case. I'm going to start with Kathleen's marriage to Drew, and then her death. Kathleen had a rough childhood. Her parents divorced when she was very young. Her stepfather didn't work. Her father didn't pay child support. Kathleen and her siblings all left home early. Kathleen herself dropped out of high school when she was 17. In my experience, I found that it's really common that a difficult childhood leads to women being in abusive relationships. In the other sense, Kathleen departed from the profile because she managed to stop her downward spiral. She got her GED and an associate's degree. She wanted a career, a home and kids. In her late 20s, Kathleen met Drew on a blind date. This is Susan Doman, Kathleen's sister. He gave a picture, maybe a four by seven picture, of in a frame. 
Of himself? Yes. To Kathleen? Yes. And said, tell me you love me. And she told me that she thought it was very odd. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, he convinced her um, that he was a good guy and he how could... Long? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I just was wondering, um, how long had they been going out when he gave her the picture? That was the first date. Kathleen didn't know it at the time, but Drew was still married to his second wife when they were dating. But six months later, Drew divorced his second wife and asked Kathleen to marry him. It didn't take long for the marriage to go sour. Drew was controlling. He'd call her constantly and demand that Kathleen tell him she loved him. In 1993, Drew put Kathleen in the hospital, but Kathleen refused to report him to the police. She stayed with him. You'd think the reason she left him was that she'd had it. She was fed up with the abuse. But you'd be wrong. The reason Kathleen finally separated from Drew in 2001 was because she got an anonymous letter. The letter said Drew, who was 47 years old, was having an affair with a 17-year-old. She worked as a night clerk at a local motel. Her name was Stacy, and everyone in town knew about it. More on that after the break. If you're fascinated by the cases that we're investigating in this show, I highly recommend checking out Law School for Everyone from The Great Courses Plus. You'll get fascinating insight from four top law professors, exploring some of the most important, decisive, and controversial court cases in American history to illuminate the inner workings of our judicial system. As someone who's curious and loves to learn, I'm a big fan of The Great Courses Plus. You learn all kinds of things. You're going to learn from engaging, award-winning professors and experts about virtually any topic. History, forensics, psychology, the arts, even how to cook or take better photos. You'll get unlimited access to over 9,000 lectures with flexibility to watch from your TV, your laptop, your tablet, or your smartphone, or listen with The Great Courses Plus app. And now they have a special offer. One month free of unlimited access. That's right. But to get this special offer, you've got to go to my URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash MCI. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash MCI. Start your free month today. You will love it. And we're back with Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, the podcast. This is Sharon Bykowski, Stacy Peterson's neighbor, also her best friend. She said to me, this is where Drew and I would come when we would have our dates. She and, and Drew would have dates in the basement while he was still married to Kathleen? Kathleen was sleeping upstairs. While Kathleen was in the house? Yeah. Ultimately, Drew, not Kathleen, filed for divorce. Primarily so he could be with Stacy. Kathleen and Drew's divorce was about as bitter as they get. Between 2002 and 2004, Kathleen called the Bolingbroke Police Department 19 times to report confrontations with Drew. Some were about custody and visitation, but several got physical. Kathleen's lawyer, Harry Smith, remembers it all. I'm trying to paint this picture for myself as, you know, and sure. for all of us. So Drew is bringing the kids back to Kathleen because they had visitation, right? Correct. And he brings Stacy along as well, the new girlfriend. Yes, so he pulled in the driveway with the camera rolling. He laid on the horn, which immediately made my client, Kathleen, come to the door and start yelling. Stacy then, who was not supposed to be there at these visitation exchanges, and by the way, who was visibly showing her pregnancy, begins this um, vulgar tirade back and forth. My client is not a wilting flower. She comes out of the house, Stacy steps out of the car, and they go to it. And Drew films them with his children in the car watching as well in a fistfight on the driveway. Oh, my God. He then hands the camera to Stacy, and he puts Kathleen into an arm bar, and she is screaming in pain. And he then gets on his phone while Stacy is filming him, and he calls the police to report the battery to Stacy. And then they even continue to roll the tape as the police officer rolls up, and I'm sure the police officer is like, what is going on? On March 11, 2002, Kathleen asked for an emergency order of protection. In the paperwork, she wrote, quote, Drew wants me dead, and if he has to, he will burn the house down just to shut me up, end quote. She told her sister, Sue, quote, he's going to kill me, and it's going to look like an accident. End quote. Now, I just can't tell you how many times I've heard this from abuse victims. 
and Nicole Brown said it repeatedly. She said, he's going to kill me, and he's going to get away with it because he's O.J. Simpson. I so wished she'd been wrong. I so wanted to prove her wrong. Back to Peterson. Although Kathleen told a lot of people, or it seems like she said it pretty often, no one called the police. And maybe partly, that's because Drew Peterson was the police. And that was a big part of the problem, because that badge gave him the edge in the battle for credibility. Here's an example of what I mean. On July 5th, Kathleen told police that Drew came to her house and he attacked her. She told him to just kill her, just get it over with. He asked where she wanted it. She gestured to her head. He took out his knife, but he said he couldn't hurt her. The police sent that report to the state's attorney. That's the prosecuting agency. Drew gave his own version of the events. He said Kathleen had invited him over, that she tried to kiss him. And when he refused, she took her clothes off and asked him if he missed it. The state's attorney decided not to take any action. I have to believe that at least part of the reason they wouldn't file the case was because Drew was a cop and Kathleen was viewed as just an angry ex who was out for revenge. And the way Drew turned the story around, claiming that Kathleen invited him to the house, then tried to seduce him, that's a behavior I've seen in other abuse cases. The abuser twists the facts to make himself the victim. But the state's attorney missed something important here, I think. Drew didn't deny going to Kathleen's house. He admitted it. He claimed that he went there because she invited him. He claimed that she came on to him. But he admitted he went. And that's something that the state's attorney should have paid more attention to because Kathleen's story makes more sense. They're in the middle of a nasty divorce. Why would she invite him over? Why would she be taking off her clothes and trying to seduce him? It just sounds like an egotistical fantasy. But the fact that he admitted going to her house, that corroborates her story. She didn't take it lying down. She wrote to the assistant state's attorney. She said she'd called them three times, but got no action. Here's an excerpt from the letter Kathleen wrote to the state's attorney about Drew. Quote, he knows how to manipulate the system, and his next step is to take my children away, or kill me instead. I haven't received help from the police here in Bolingbrook, and I'm asking for your help now, before it's too late. Could it be any more clear? Could it have been any more prophetic? But again, according to her sister Anna, the state's attorney's office ignored the letter. Kathleen's lawyer said that although the state's attorney had her in for a routine interview, nobody ever followed up. And the mayor of Bolingbrook actually sympathized with Drew and said, quote, Kathy was known as a hellcat, unquote. Now, part of the reason the mayor made that remark is probably because Drew spread stories about Kathleen being promiscuous and being a drunk who was out of control. At the very least, I think these stories undermine Kathleen's credibility and, of course, also undermine her reports of abuse. A property settlement hearing was scheduled for early 2004. And according to Harry Smith, Kathleen's lawyer, she and the kids stood to do okay. But like I said before, Kathleen never got that settlement because in March of 2004, she was found dead in a waterless tub. She had a gash on her head and her hair was wet. But there was no sign of forced entry. The coroner said the cause of death was accident, that she'd slipped and fallen, hit her head on the tub, and drowned. Now, a little bit of legal background for you that's important to understand. In Bolingbrook at that time, the determination as to whether a death was a homicide, a suicide, or an accident was made by a coroner's inquest jury. What's that? Well, an inquest jury is just six lay people, just like you and me. They listen to the testimony from a coroner, maybe a cop, maybe a few civilian witnesses, and then they make their decision. Now, personally, I think that system is bizarre. It makes no sense to me that lay people with no medical training at all would make a decision like that. And in my opinion, this Peterson case shows why that's so wrong. Because in spite of the fact that Kathleen's sister, Susan, testified to the abuse that Kathleen suffered at Drew's hands and to all of his threats to kill her, the jury found that the death was the result of an accidental drowning. And ironically, I think part of the reason they made that finding was because of Stacy. Stacy testified at that inquest. She said that Drew had been with her all night. She gave him a complete alibi. So let's talk about Stacy's relationship with Drew. And let's start with 
Stacy's childhood. Like Kathleen, Stacy had a chaotic childhood, but hers was even worse. Her parents were heavy drinkers, and when Stacy was a teenager, her mother disappeared, walked out the door, and just never came back. All the kids thought that their mom had been murdered by her boyfriend, but that mystery was never solved. At the time she met Drew, Stacy was living with her older sister, Tina. Drew, an older man, a man with money, and with a job, was a means to escape. Stacy's aunt, Candace Aiken, remembers this point in Stacy's life. Stacy told me that she met Drew at, when she was working at a nighttime job. She said that she really, she really liked him. They would um, talk a lot. They hung out a lot together, and they would take walks and stuff, and she just felt really comfortable with him. What was your impression of him? Well, he seemed nice. Um, he seemed really nice. He was very nice and respectful of me. He seemed, um, I don't know, maybe kind of like a charmer. Mm -hmm. Were you suspiciously so? You know what I mean? Somebody who was laying it on a little thick? Yeah, it makes you wonder, you know, what's the motive here? What's going on, you know? So Drew and Stacy got married the moment his divorce from Kathleen was final. They had two children very quickly. And it didn't take long for Drew to revert to type. He always was telling her that how ugly she was and stuff like that at the beginning. So I think it was just like a progression of things or just making her feel ugly. I don't know if he was necessarily saying because she never felt pretty when she was with Drew. Did she tell you that? Yes. Yeah, that she didn't feel pretty. She didn't feel pretty enough. I think that's why she went and did all the things that she did surgically. <laughs> what did she do? She had her. She had a tummy tuck, and she had a breast enhance, enhancement, or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. um, she did things like that. She had all of her teeth that had the silver fillings made into the white fillings, so her teeth would be pretty. She was just doing all these things to make herself look pretty. Stacy's best friend and neighbor, Sharon Bykowski, said Drew would call constantly while she and Stacy shopped. We went to Walmart, which is a mile from this house. And then we walked in and she forgot she left her phone. So because he couldn't get a hold of her for like 20 minutes, he's calling my phone. Where is she? I said, she's in the next aisle. Why isn't she with you? I said, because she doesn't need paper towels. Stacy told her Aunt Candace that Drew wouldn't let her go anywhere or do anything. And Stacy's friend Bruce said, quote, she couldn't have any friends, no other friends beside family or sharing the neighbor. She couldn't have friends that were guys, that's for sure. He'd keep tabs on her every move, end quote. Sound familiar? Anyway, predictably, their marriage soured too. They had two children together. But after a few years, things had gotten really bad. And according to her Aunt Candace, Stacy told Drew she wanted him to move out. And so we went to the store. She wanted to get some limes and I wanted to get bananas. And when we got to the store, we sat in the car for like an hour and a half, and she was telling me how she wanted him out, and she was trying to figure out how to have all the children. I was, I felt very afraid in that car. I was looking around for Drew. I thought maybe he was going to follow us. Why were you afraid? I just, it was just so uncomfortable because she, if, I don't know, just the vibe. She was afraid. She just... Stacy didn't know who to trust. She didn't know who to trust. She didn't know who to trust of Drew's friends. She she didn't know where to go in that car that night in 2007, October. She did not know where to go. She did not know where to turn. I don't know how to explain the feeling, but it was, she just felt trapped and it didn't feel like there was any way out. Just 11 days before Stacy disappeared, she wrote an email to a friend about her marriage. It said, quote, I have been arguing quite a bit with my husband. As I mature with age, I'm finding that the relationship I'm in is controlling, manipulative, and somewhat abusive, end quote. Somewhat abusive. Around that same time, Stacy got a new cell phone. And then, just two days before she disappeared, Stacy called a divorce attorney. Ironically, Harry Smith 
the same lawyer Kathleen used for her divorce. She said he doesn't know about this cell phone, but what's so amazing is as she's talking to me, I hear Drew screaming at her from the back door, and she's like, I'll be in in a minute. And he was like yelling, like, get in here. Wow. So I, if she's talking on a cell phone, I don't know how she thought he didn't know she had, I, I don't know. That you thought, well, she's telling you that she knows he killed Kathleen, so it's amazing to me that she wasn't, well, she probably was afraid. If she knew he killed Kathleen, she knew she was on the chopping block as well. One would think so. Yeah. Two days later, Stacy disappeared. So you know exactly, you know exactly what I'm thinking. Oh, absolutely. He found out she talked to me, and I better get a hold of somebody quick. Wow. On our TV show, Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, we explore the events surrounding her disappearance. What did you do? You saw that she disappeared. I called the number on the screen to the state police. They told me, um, I mean, this is not an institutional indictment of the state police, but I'm not kidding you. The guy who answered the call said, we are really super busy here with Halloween and all. We'll get back to you. What? <laughs> and I said, that. this guy didn't know anything about the case. I mean, I was hitting him with too many facts. Although a lengthy and exhaustive search was conducted, Stacy's body was never found. But in yet another ironic twist, it was Stacy's disappearance that finally led to justice for Kathleen. There didn't seem to be enough evidence to arrest Drew for Stacy's murder. The body was missing. They didn't have any physical evidence. There was a lot the police still didn't know. But the circumstances of her disappearance and Drew's likely involvement in it were very suspicious. Suspicious enough to make the DA reopen Kathleen's case and have her body exhumed and re-autopsied. And finally, in February of 2008, Kathleen's death was ruled a homicide. Drew was prosecuted for the murder of Kathleen Savio, and Harry Smith, her divorce lawyer, was called as a witness. Not by the prosecution, but of all things, by the defense. Now, why the defense called him? It's a crazy thing. More on that after the break. Audiobooks are great for helping you be a better you. Whether you want to feel healthier, get motivated, or learn something new, Audible's offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Membership includes one free audiobook a month, exclusive sales, and 30% off all regularly priced audiobooks. Okay, I love this one. John Ronson, The Psychopath Test. Actually, it's a really simple checklist that you go through in that book, and you can see if you're a psychopath. Wouldn't you like to know? And you can listen to it on Audible. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audible.com slash MCI48 or text MCI48 to 500-500 to get started today. And there's a great listen guarantee. Didn't like it? You can swap it. Kevin Dutton, The Wisdom of Psychopaths, What Saints, Spies, and Serial Killers Can Teach Us About Success. Yes, they, they are good at things. Anyway, unlike a streaming or rental service, with Audible, you own your books. Free apps for iPhone, iPad, Android, and Windows Phone. Go to audible.com slash MCI48 or text MCI48 to 500-500 to get started. You can do it with audiobooks. And we're back with Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, the podcast. I'm going to say this. I think, based on his conversation with me before I took the stand, he was very interested in the fact that my client, Kathleen Savio, now dead, this is the murder trial of her, had not disclosed that she was working, I'm not kidding you, at a Red Lobster or some sort of photo, like Kodak shop. I mean... Who would even care? I, and what are you, yeah. you going to do? You're going to ask me if she lied in, in a divorce case when she's the victim of a murder. They were trying, basically, to use Harry Smith to dirty up the victim, to give the jury a reason not to like Kathleen. And i got to tell you one other thing about Harry Smith. He's a former prosecutor. So this is a man with a lot of trial experience. This is a man who knows how to think fast, because he turned out to be the prosecution's star witness. Now, this was Kathleen's murder trial. Stacey Kales was the focus of my testimony. But I can't imagine that they didn't know the content of her phone call to me. <laughs> he leads me into a conversation about my conversation he just asked me, what'd she tell you? He didn't couch it in any terms. I just told him, yeah. She said, maybe can we get more money in this divorce if I go to the police and tell them how he killed Kathleen? I tell you, you know how you look at a jury? Yeah. And you know, they've heard a lot. They've been there and gone through a ton of evidence. Right. Um, the shock that went through them and the pencils came up and the pads came up. And boy, everybody was paying attention then. Worst strategy 
I may have ever seen, I gotta say. So after just two days of deliberations, the jury found Drew guilty of first-degree murder. On the day he was sentenced, Drew screamed in court. I did not kill Kathleen! That's the voice of the murderer who killed Kathleen. Now, I know these abusive relationships pose a lot of thorny problems, raise a lot of questions, and I don't have all the answers. But I know an expert who does. Hey, thank you so much for doing this podcast. I so appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to do it. My name is Jackie Marroquin. I am the Director of Programs with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. For the first 10 years, I worked at a local domestic violence center here in California. I was one of the people who, you know, would go at 2 o'clock in the morning to support a rape survivor at the hospital. And I was also the person who would pick up a family at midnight and take them to the shelter. Is it fair to say you've helped hundreds, if not thousands, of domestic violence victims? Hundreds, if not thousands, yes. So you have listened to some of the clips in the Drew Peterson case. I don't know if you're familiar with the the case itself. Do you recall? I do. I remember I was very much attuned to it when it was happening. It was interesting to me that there were certain similarities between Kathleen and Stacy. Do you notice a kind of pattern when it comes to the kind of person who winds up in these abusive relationships? Uh, certainly, I saw there. there is definitely a pattern in a quick involvement in relationships. So a very quick honeymoon phase where someone is kind of swept off their feet. Things look great. Everything looks perfect. This person is everything we have ever wanted. Um, and so that those are all um, red flags that we normally talk about when we work with survivors and, and trying to identify what are some of those things that maybe someone missed. Yeah, Drew Peterson had a habit of demanding from both Kathleen and Stacy that they constantly reassure him. Um, he'd call a million times a day to Kathleen to say, tell me you love me, say you love me. It's never enough. And that's the other thing that I heard so much from survivors. It's never enough. I can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I can call every 15 minutes. I can tell this person I love them every moment of the day, and it's still not enough. And so my response was always, well, maybe they're the ones with the problem and not you. Yeah. Stacy was saying she's the fourth wife. She knew what she was going through with Drew, his controlling behavior, the way he was constantly spying on her. She would go shopping with a friend and he'd be sitting in the parking lot of the shopping mall waiting for her. I mean, she knew what he was all about. And yet when she talked about his third wife, Kathleen, they were going through a very ugly divorce. She would say, Kathleen's crazy. That just struck me as, how can you say that? You're living with the guy who's doing this to you. I mean, some form of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really difficult thing, I think, to describe to or for, for those of us on the outside looking in to really understand that idea of gaslighting, really, truly taking control over someone else's reality. And a lot of that has to do with that same type of manipulation that, mm-hmm. well, you're different. Mm-hmm. Well, you are different. I left her for you. Right. You know, for those of us on the outside looking into these relationships, things look very clear to us. It is much more murky when you are in the situation. Think about watching a car accident right in front of you. And you can watch that car accident happening right in front of you in the moment. And you can prepare for what to do in the event of an accident. You can prepare all you want. But when it happens... It's, you might have a very different reaction than the one that you thought you were going to have. Yeah. So we can watch that same accident on, you know, on YouTube and say, oh, this is exactly what needs to happen. But we have the time and the space and we're in a safe place and they're right in the middle of it. They're mm-hmm. in the thick of it. And it's really difficult in a moment of crisis to be able to look at things from the outside looking in. So what should friends and family do when they actually see this pattern emerge? Oh, this is the hardest part, I think, for friends and family, Um, because naturally, if my friend was um, behaving in this way, I would want to rush in and rescue them. The reality, however, is very, very different. For many family members, asking the person that they love to leave someone they they care about um, will often lead to a no, (laughs) I'm not ready, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. So what do you, do you have any advice? Do you have for a method of approach that a friend or a family member could use to try and get past the denial and get past the uh, defensiveness that they might meet? Yes, and it's not an easy one. 
The uh, advice that I would give family and friends who are dealing with this is to one, listen without judgment. Right. The victim is the expert in their own situation. Mm -hmm. And so if it were easy to leave, you know, this field would not exist, but it's never easy to leave. Listen without judgment, even though it's hard. And then the other thing I would say is to not take it personally when someone declines your offer of help. Thank you so much, Jackie. I, I think it's wonderful, wonderful to have you on. I so appreciate your time. There's just a whole world of of important things that comes from your kind of work and, and what you're doing. And I thank you for it. And thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Thank you. Now I know hindsight always gives you perfect vision. And I can't say for sure what would have ultimately happened to Kathleen or Stacy if someone had acted on their cries for help. But it's my sincere belief that if someone had done right by Kathleen, if they'd taken her reports of abuse seriously, if they'd listened when she told them how he threatened to kill her, if Drew had just been arrested for any of these things, she'd still be alive today. And so would Stacy. You hope that Drew gets prosecuted for Stacy's murder? I do. I do hope that there is vindication for Stacy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, for closure and yeah. 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 I, I yeah. mean, they're saying they're going to prosecute without a, without a body, which is, but it just would be nice to know answers, the truth. Yeah. Kathleen's and Stacy's stories are famous, but they're far from unusual. In spite of all we've learned about spousal abuse, especially after the Simpson case, it's still all too common for women who report domestic violence to be dismissed as hysterical or vindictive or as conniving to gain advantage in a nasty divorce. And that's what often leads to a tragic end. As I mentioned earlier, I investigated the Drew Peterson case on my TV show, Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, and I uncovered evidence that few people know about. So tune in. It airs Thursday night, tonight at 9 p.m. on A&E, or watch it online at AETV.com. And now it's time for the MCI Mailbag, where Marsha delves into your questions about last week's case. You guys sent us a lot of emails, so we've invited a friend of the show on to act as your surrogate inquirer. Let's jump in. So the Casey Anthony episode prompted a lot of terrific questions, Marsh. Mary Beth asks, is there some way that Casey Anthony can be retried, perhaps for another crime? Technically, yes, but practically, no. There is no double jeopardy between state and federal courts. So in theory, even though she was acquitted in state court, she certainly could be tried by the feds. They never do it. I mean, I think the only time I ever saw the federal courts take up a case where someone was acquitted in state court was the Rodney King officers in Los Angeles. The federal courts stepped in after they were acquitted on all charges by the jury. So as a practical matter, no, there's really nothing left to try her for. The feds won't do it, and the state can't. And there's nothing Double else jeopardy. she can be tried for. Nothing else left. Okay. Okay. Um, Billy wants to know if they overcharged with the first-degree murder. So this is a question I've had before from people, and there was kind of this group think going, along, going around that the prosecution overcharged Casey, mm -hmm. and that had they only given the option to the jury of lesser charges, they might have convicted her. Right. But that knowing that, A, it was only first-degree murder was an op was the only option, and that then death penalty would be on the table, and they'd have to decide that, right. um, they decided to shy away from the whole thing and acquitted her. But that's not the case. Okay. That's, that, that's one of those misperceptions that gets repeated often enough that people believe it. The truth is, they charged Casey Anthony with everything less than first-degree murder. It was just they gave him a whole range of choices. First, second, the equivalent of manslaughter, child abuse, child neglect. They were offered really down to practically misdemeanors. They had lots of options. Lots. And they chose none of them. They chose a, a, a no, they convicted her of lying to the police. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Mitch wants to know if Kaylee's DNA was ever located in the trunk of the car. No. No, it wasn't. And I think I think if it had been Maybe there would have been a shot at a conviction, but I'm not sure because imagine what the jury then thinks or right. what the defense certainly would argue. I would. Of course, her, her DNA is in the trunk. I mean, she was probably playing around right, there before sure. and she jumped into the trunk. Who knows when? Doesn't mean her dead body was in the trunk. Right, right. Of course, yeah. it's her mom's car. Yeah. Um, Anne wants to know, why, do, why didn't the defense have to turn over their knowledge of the Firefox search during discovery? 
So that's a really good question. So this comes down to the rules of discovery. The defense only has to turn over discovery of evidence they plan to present at trial. Obviously, oh, okay. if they stumble across evidence like the Firefox search for foolproof suffocation, right. that's incriminating. I mean, that's a scary thing to right? – you're not going to take a chance with it's that. not helpful. Jose Baez in his book wrote that it was actually a search conducted by George Anthony Casey's father. Um, but the truth of the matter is we determined that the timing of it showed it couldn't have been her father. He was at work at the right. time and it had to be Casey. She was the only one home. Right. So any, in any case, short answer is – the defense doesn't have to turn over discovery of anything unless they plan to present it at trial, so they didn't have to turn over the search for foolproof suffocation that they found. Okay. So uh, Holly says, uh, she says, what if Zanny, as in Zanny the nanny, what if Zanny was actually Xanax, used to knock Kaylee out, therefore babysitting her? Yeah, I think that people were talking I've about that. that a lot, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, it was, I, I actually thought it was reporters who made that up. No idea, but I have heard this a few places. Yeah. It's entirely possible. I mean, who knows what was in Casey's, you know, Casey's fevered brain uh, and why she made up the bad particular name. Who knows? Right. Um, could it have been Xanax that she used to knock out Kaylee? I mean, we'll never know because we can't tell her remains. There wasn't right. enough left you could to know what was. You could anything. Yeah. Right. Those are some great questions. I want to thank all of you for for sending them in. Those are great. Know, please, that you can also call in. And if you do call in, you're going to put my friend out of a job because then we're going to play your voice, your call, on the air, and I'll be answering your questions. That's right. Not that I don't love having my friend here That's right. to do it. Try to beat this dulcet tone when you when you leave your message. <laughs> and, uh... So send in your questions about Drew Peterson. We'll answer them at the end of the show. And I encourage you to call in I've set up a hotline to make it easy for you. Here's the number, 402-882-6474. That's 402-882-6474. Call in with information or call in with questions. Next week, we'll be getting into Chandra Levy. Marsha Clark Investigates, the First 48, the podcast. Hosted by Marsha Clark. Produced by Emil Klein and Chelsea Great. Researched by Robin Kiyomi. Supervising producer is Scott Brody. Executive producers are Marsha Clark, Ted Butler, and Peter Tarshis. And thanks to Tarek and Esther. Music is by Blake Maples. Special thanks to Rob Wood, who did our craft services. Those sandwiches were horrible. Were distributed by Audio Boom. The TV series Marsha Clark Investigates, The First 48, is produced by ITV and airs at 9 p.m. Thursdays on a &E. Find out more at AETV.com. But hang on. Any information, communications, or material you submit to the Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48 podcast by email, download, telephone, or otherwise is non-confidential. And AETN is free to use and reproduce such submission freely and for any purpose. Please see the site for complete submission terms.